Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Friday Ramblings. We are wrapping up our Halloween Countdown special themed episodes because we are going out with a big bang. We are going back to one of the kings of psychological horror. One of the most iconic stories of demons messing with human beings ever. It has been sequelized, homogenized, pasteurized, franchised, but has never really been properly duplicated, mostly due to the exceptional writing of the original author. We are talking about The Exorcist by William Peter Blatty. Now, I did buy this copy used. It is not 100% my fault that the cover's torn slightly. And this is obviously not a first printing because it does reference the movie adaptation, which we are also going to discuss. This is, uh, we're not going to discuss the entire franchise. This time go around, we're going to focus on the first, the first story, both book and movie version, which I also have. I own here. Modern prints uh, refer to this as the director's cut or extended cut, again, depending on the exact printing. But I have owned this since it first hit DVD, so it is the version you've never seen. It was a cute marketing gimmick for the release of it. Still, it is what it is. And this movie is anything but cute, as is the story. So... Let's go ahead and knock a few things out first. Let's discuss the writer William Peter Blatty. William Peter Blatty, who was born in 1928 and died in 2017, was a writer, director, and producer. Who wrote many things. Including the novels Elsewhere, Demeter, Crazy and the Ninth Configuration, as well as his sequel to The Exorcist Legion, which would be the third movie, but again, we'll talk about the follow-up stuff another time. Uh, he also wrote I, Billy Shakespeare, and The Exorcist for the 21st Century in 2016, short, about a year or so before his death. And in films, has worked as a screenwriter on The Man from the Diners Club, Shot in the Dark, John Goldfarb, Please Come Home, Promise or Anything, What Did You Do in the War, Daddy, Gun, The Great Bank Robbery, Darling Lily, the adaptation of The Exorcist, in which he was both a screenwriter and producer, Mastermind, the director, screenwriter, and producer of his Ninth Configuration novel, and was director and screenwriter of The Exorcist 3, which, as I said, was based off the sequel novel. As, again, real short, Hollywood decided to do a Exorcist 2 as its own thing without being based off anything uh, Mr. Blatty wrote. So when they did adapt his eventually written second book, which was really the way it was originally written, more of a spin-off book than a direct sequel. They made that into Exorcist 3 since they had already rushed their own sequel. Things happen. So, let's get into The Exorcist itself. Now, I'm sure most people know the story, but for those few people who have not seen the, the movie or read the novel, either version's good. Basic story is that an elderly Jesuit priest named Father Marin is on sabbatical leading an archaeological dig in northern Iraq and studying ancient relics. He then uncovers a statue of the demon Pazuzu, before encountering a series of omens that alert him to a pending confrontation with a great evil that he, in his youth, battled once before in an African exorcism. 
At the same time, in Georgetown, a young girl named Regan McNeil is le living with her mother, actress Chris McNeil. Her father is divorced from his mother and is an absent presence in her life. The McNeil household also has a couple of servants as well as a babysitter for Regan. For a reason that is not immediately explained, Regan begins acting out of sorts psychologically, which Chris immediately or initially blah, 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 attributes to a result of stress and suppressed anger over her father's lack of presence in her life, up to and including missing promised and scheduled phone calls to Regan. As time goes on, these psychological changes seem to be causing physical symptoms as well, and things get worse and worse, where it is not simply a matter of Regan acting a little bratty, but being flat out dangerous to be around. After a series of tests performed by the best medical professionals in Georgetown, and let me tell you something, uh, Georgetown, for people that are not familiar with it, is actually has some pretty prestigious universities associated with it as it is a localized district of Washington, D.C. And so when we do say the best medical experts in Georgetown, these are potentially some of the best medical experts in the country, especially in the 70s. So, nobody has a real cure for her. Despite being an atheist, Chris is eventually turned on to the local chapter of the Jesuit priests in town, and specifically one particular priest, Father Karras, who, besides being a priest, is also a trained psychiatrist. Karras wants to debunk the suspicions of demonic possession, believing that, you know, such things really don't happen. Yes, the Catholic Church in the past has done exorcisms, but it's not something they do anymore, as most of those exorcisms have, over the decades and centuries, now been understood to be cases of people with genuine non-spiritual based mental health problems. Exorcisms are almost unheard of in modern times. Now this is a bit of real life leaking in. Fact is, especially in the 21st century, if anybody does an exorcism, they're not affiliated with any major Christian denomination. You know, it's just not something the churches really believe in now as official policy. Just something to keep in mind. Father Cares does agree to see the child, though, as a psychiatrist, wanting to get to the heart of what is going on with Regan's mind to put the mother at ease, as well as help an innocent child who is suffering from something. Unfortunately, for Father Karras's faith, which has been shaken, Due to his own personal crisis following the death of his mother, Father Karras actually does seem to find evidence of demonic possession that he cannot deny. He petitions the church for the rights to do an exorcism, and it is agreed to under the understanding that a priest experienced with them does so. Hence, we get a return of Father Merrick. The exorcism is performed, Father Merrick dies in the passing. It is up to Karis to save the day. Can Karis do so? Will he get a renewed faith in God in the process? Well, you're going to have to watch to find out. I ain't going into that too deep of spoilers. So, here's the real fun part. 
Why is this such an iconic story? Well, we're going to pick on the novel's version of events first. Besides Regan's behavior being out of sorts, there's local acts of vandalism, especially those centering around religious statues and buildings happening around Georgetown. Now, it's never 100% confirmed that these are directly connected to the demon possessing Regan. Potentially just its mere presence in the area was bringing out the wickedness in people. This, along with Regan's odd behavior and tie-ins to potential deaths of Chris's social circle, causes a local detective by the name of Kinderman to get involved. He serves as almost a bit of a subplot in the novels. He specifically helps uncover some things going on between the um, household staff that Chris McNeil employs uh, and their own personal problems that, on the surface, seem to be connected to what's going on to Regan, but are actually completely separate from that or the acts of vandalism. Through this, Kinderman also makes friends with Father Karras, which means that when everything finally goes down on the night of the exorcism, he is not far away. But the biggest thing of it all is just the slow burn of it. The classic visuals that people associate with the movie do occur in the book, however, they do not occur until the back half of the book, if not the back third. Most of the book is setting up the introduction of what life was like for Chris and Regan McNeil before the demonic shenanigans and the slow descent over a long period of time for Regan. This was not a modern day snap of the fingers, I'm suddenly demonically possessed and freaking out thing. This was a slow and subtle manipulation of a child's psyche and eventual body for, you know, from a centuries-old mastermind of evil and manipulation, which is one of those things I always felt like modern horror gets wrong when they do these instant quick-fix uh, demonic possessions. It's like, look, dude, these things are centuries old. Any demon that's capable of possessing a human probably done it two or three times before over its eternal existence, you'd think they would have learned how to be subtle by now. Yeah? Learning curve. Improve your behavior after failing and recognizing why you failed. If you're going to claim to be a being of intelligence, you should have that capability. But Pazuzu itself is definitely a long game long haul manipulating jerk. Initially presenting itself to Regan as a harmless imaginary friend, the entity manages to convince Regan to let it in under a veil of trust that is complete bull. This as I said, is the strongest part of the novel. We, we know as the readers something really bad is happening to this child. We know the adults have to figure this out eventually to get to that big final conflict that when you encounter fiction, you know is going to happen. But it's the journey to that understanding of everybody about what's really going on that is the power of this seeing Chris McNeil as a mother despairing as each theory is debunked, each possible medical treatment fails to work, and they become more invasive and painful for young Regan. You just you feel so much sympathy for Chris as a single mother who just wants her child to be happy and safe and healthy. 
and you feel bad for Regan who doesn't understand what's going on and is literally day by day losing more control over herself. So by the time you actually get to, hey, it's a demon, we're going to do an exorcism, you are so emotionally ready for this. You have been taken on a roller coaster of a ride of suspense. I mean, I have read a lot of stuff. I have seen a lot of movies. And I mean, really, this is where Blatty does it best. His ability to just keep you going chapter after chapter of suspense building and red herrings and false leads so that you are just chomping at the bit for this final battle between good and evil. You're so excited when the protagonists finally understand what's going on because you've been through this mystery with them. You see the work being done by the doctors, by Father Karras, by Detective Kinderman, as they try this lead, try that lead, look at the clues, relook at the clues. Everybody wants to know what's going on, and you have to go on that journey with them. It's so emotionally heart wrenching and satisfying. Just that, mm, it's just such, it's so, such a good journey. So what about the movie? Well, the movie is all of that. This is one of those adaptations that thankfully doesn't make any major changes to the story. You get a little less with Kinderman, the subplot with the household staff and their red herring of their own problems is missing. But the core story, that slow burn sense of, of what is going on here exactly, is still there. You still get some good quality time with Chris and Regan before everything goes crazy. But more importantly is, as much as I love reading, as powerful as books can be, the movie is just so good. You know, as things start getting obvious that this is not a standard case of a child acting out because of emotional turmoil they can't really communicate with correctly, that it just it creeps you out. You know, there are scenes in the in the movie where you're walking through, you know, walking past different parts of the house and you see these these demonic faces in the doorways and in reflections and you're just like oh my god did, did I see what I saw and that's one of the big benefits of seeing it at home you know you can I mean I don't know what it was like for people watching it in theaters in the 70s but I mean like when I was watching it at home I'm like oh my god let me rewind that let me pause that <gasps> it is it's a creepy face <gasps> rewind that <gasps> I can hear like weird audio whisperings in the background. Like there's all these tiny little things that play into what I said before that Pazuzu is a subtle manipulator who is patient and is not going to reveal itself until it knows it has full control of the situation. Pazuzu is not here to play. Pazuzu is here to destroy lives and it will do it whether you like it or not. This is legitimately, you know, in that psychological suspense style, probably the greatest movie ever made by Hollywood. You know? It's not, it doesn't have the highest body count. It's not gory. You know, that, that's what slasher films are for. And I love me some slasher films, don't get me wrong. But when it comes to something that messes with your head, 
and takes you on that roller coaster of suspense and dread of just oh my god if it's this bad now how bad is it going to be when everything goes full tilt when all the subtlety's gone and it's time for that last big push you know how crazy is it going to be that suspense that build up of oh my god I can't wait oh this is going to be just mind blowing and it is it satisfies the hype that the movie builds up in that for that final scenes. It doesn't let you down. It it's something that lingers in your head. And I mean that's something people talked about in the 70s. You know, people that watched this movie when it was new in theaters. That was some of their reviews like, "Oh, I'm writing this days after watching the movie and this movie is still with me." Like, I'm this movie is affecting my dreams. This is just, it's following me. You know, what? That, that's the best thing horror genre wants. To have their creations linger in your mind. You know, I, I saw this decades after it came out. After I knew it was a thing. And all the cultural icon status of it. It lived up to all of that. It's an incredibly well put together movie. Let me, let me pull up some cast stats for you. Uh, let me... Alright, directed by William Friedkin. Who's, you know, a, a master of this. You know, your, your cast. Ellen Burstyn. Max Van Sydow. Who's... Iconic. I mean, I, I could do a whole episode on Max by himself. You know, Linda Blair is Regan. Or, uh, I mean, a role that literally, you know, has dogged her her entire career. Distributed by Warner Brothers. Woo! Uh, here you go. Had a budget of $12 million. And again, that is $12 million, um, you know, which, which is pretty cheap for movies by modern day standards. But still, box office draw of $441.3 million. Like, this, 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 this was not a thing. You know, when, when it was in theaters, you know, a lot of critics panned it. They weren't happy with it. Um, some loved it. But, you know, you had people in that would watch the movie in theaters, and a lot of them came back and rewatched it. And this movie came out in the winter. They were sitting out in the cold, in, in long lines, like, this isn't some, oh, walk up to theater, maybe stand there for five minutes. Like, they're standing in line for way longer than that to see the movie again. Because, as I said, it's the kind of thing that goes home with you. It just embeds itself in your brain. Once you see The Exorcist, you will never forget having seen it. And if you've read it, woo! That's the kind of thing where if you read it, and you don't already have a good, uh, you know, bit of calluses from reading other horror stuff, you may find yourself, like, hiding that book up in the attic or something. You know, that's, that's the kind of book where, like, you'll finish it and you'll go, I'm not going to put this on the bookshelf in my other books. I'm going to, like, put this in a locked chest so it can't get me again. So it stays away. That's, I mean, that's... I really cannot say enough great about William Blatley. Um, he he just killed it on this. Um, so, let's wrap it up. Because, I mean, there's really nothing else I can tell you without breaking my standing minimal spoilers policy. And that is... If you've never seen The Exorcist, if you've never read The Exorcist, do it. 
Pick your poison. In fact, do what I did. Do both. Now, I saw it first before I was able to find a copy of the novel. Either way works. Read it, then watch it. Watch it, then read it. They're both pretty similar in plot, but the added content in the novel is worth getting exposed to. You know, if you read the novel first, the film's worth watching for just appreciating what Friedkin did to add to the visuals and to really bring those words to life. You want something to watch on Halloween after the kids go to bed or while they're out trick-or-treating? Hey, go for it. Because you know what? You might find stuff that's gorier. You might find stuff that's got a higher body count. You might find stuff that's, you know, more in your face than special effects. But if you want something or you're going to lay awake in bed hours later praying that you don't dream about this. Praying that you forget some of what you were exposed to the next day. This is your kind of spooky. This is a book that will make you turn on more lights when you read it at night. It will make you call friends over because you don't want to be alone while reading this. What better way to get into Halloween than that? As I said, this is how you end things with a big bang. The best of the best. So, next Friday, we're going to be in November. We're going to be pulling back from the spooky. Back to our regularly scheduled kind of programming. But, the channel itself is not done yet because, woo, we still have our Halloween Day bonus episode of my Bardic Plays game streams. Check it out. It's good news. It's good stuff. I'm not going to tell you everything because you need to watch. But let's just say it's something that longtime viewers of the channels have been waiting a year for. Because, yes, that's how I roll. I'm a little mean that way. In the meantime and in between time, subscribe to the channel. Like the videos if you liked it. Tell me in the comments what you think of The Exorcist. And stick with us because we will be here every Friday to celebrate all the greatness that is entertainment. Because that's how we roll. We bring you good stuff. This is your treat. And we don't trick. As long as you don't trick us first. Happy Halloween, folks.